everybody. I'm gonna wait patiently while Nicola. You don't have to run. No, no. I'm just. I'm not. I'm not joking. Or not. I'm happy to wait. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, happy Monday. Welcome to the State Department. I don't have anything at the top, so I'm gonna catch Matt off guard. He was. I can't believe you have nothing. Absolutely nothing to say. Really? I'm, a, I'm an open book. Are you? In that case. <laughs> Uh, so to speak. I just want to be yeah, sure. kind of, of logistical, technical question okay. about uh, NATO funding, given sure. some recent comments from the White House. How much exactly is um, Germany in arrears? Uh, so first of all, um, with respect to Germany's funding level, um, I'd refer you to NATO and or Germany to speak to. Uh, how much it, dispend, it spends on its defense and how much of that goes to uh, NATO. Um, really, it's, um, it's, uh, it's not for us necessarily to speak to that. It's a tweet well, me like, the, I, I'm sorry, there seems to be another, at least one other building in town that does think that it's appropriate. Well, look, I mean, everybody system. said, and we've said this many, many times before, that, uh, you know, NATO allies need to step up uh, their burden sharing commitments that, and frankly, to the 2% uh, level that they all uh, committed to at Wales uh, in, uh, uh, in 2014. So all NATO members committed to that 2% pledge. Yeah. Now, where they're at in meeting that pledge is up to them or to NATO to speak to. That's all two, I'm saying. Two things about that. Please, go ahead. One, um, that money, the 2%, how much, how, how much of that is each country, what percentage of that of each country <clears throat> goes directly to fund NATO operations? Uh, I, I think it varies from country to country, is my understanding. Does any of it? Aside from the contribution that each country provides for the maintenance, you know, the upkeep of the, the organization in Brussels itself. Right, how, right, how right, much, right, right, right. No, no, but for NATO operations. How much of those, how much of that 2% commitment to the defense budget is supposed to go to NATO operations? Well, again, it's every ally, uh, ally rather, uh, is committed to spending 2% more for their respective defense yeah, budgets. How, how much of that goes directly to NATO? I don't it, know. It I don't have a breakdown. That's a NATO question. Mark, I just do you, don't have that breakdown. You used to work at I understand that, but I don't have current breakdowns for, for what percent of every ally's uh, uh, defense budget. No, I, I know the 2% commitment, Matt. I, I don't know what we're arguing here. I'm not arguing. Okay. I'm just trying to ask you how much money Germany is in arrears. And again, that's a question for Germany. Okay, the two percent figure. Yes, that, they didn't. That's agree. a target. Yeah, for that, many countries. Right, right, right. But they did they agree to do to two percent funding of their defense budgets in by uh, 2015, 2016. I think they committed themselves to two percent of GDP target by 2024. So. Oh, that's seven years from now, right? That's correct. Wait. So even yes. if countries are don't ask me to do math. Even even if 2014 minus 17 is 7, I believe. Am I wrong? No, you're right. Okay. I said, don't ask me. <laughs> um, so, even if countries are not yet spending the 2% GDP on their defense, it is this year in 2017, is it correct to say that they've fallen behind on meeting that commitment? I think what it's correct to say is that. Um, and this is, as you know, who followed NATO for years, it's, it's, uh, it's not news that uh, NATO and that the United States is looking for a commitment by all NATO allies to reach that 2% target as soon as they can. Um, it's essential to keeping NATO um, the uh, capable, ready force uh, that it should be. Um, and I think, you know, there are countries who meet that, there are countries who fall short. But there are, but coming out of Wales, there was this pledge to, uh, to reach that goal. Um, and uh, again, I, I'm not going to necessarily speak on behalf of, uh, of Germany's defense spending schedule, except to say that that's a goal we want to see all NATO members eventually I'm reach. I'm not asking you to okay. speak on behalf of Germany. I'm asking you, though, what, what, is it is it correct that Germany is behind in paying dues, quote unquote, uh, or 
that Germany owes vast sums of money to the United States uh, for NATO and, and NATO operations. I'm going to say that NATO, I think, currently, or NATO, Germany currently spends about 1.2 percent of GDP on defense. That's fine. That's we not wanted my to reach two percent. I'm not going to speak. I just don't know whether they're behind, whether they owe any arrears. Um, I think any NATO ally spends what it can afford to spend uh, with the goal towards reaching that 2 percent. All right. I'll drop it there. Okay. Can I follow up on that one? Uh, you, see, you say you don't know, but and refer to NATO, but I've already spoken to NATO. They're not in arrears on, main, on the maintenance of NATO. That's a $2 billion budget, uh, and that is all member states are fully paid up to that. Mm -hmm. As you've just noted in, in your answer to, to Matt, there's a 10-year plan in, in Wales to go up to 2%. So given that that's a 10-year plan, they haven't fallen behind on that. The president's tweet was very clear. He thinks they owe some money to somebody, the United States apparently. Well, again, To whom does Germany owe money? Uh, again, I would refer to the White House to answer the, the question about the president's tweets. In Beijing, Secretary Tillerson twice uh, used language uh, that was identical to Chinese leaders on the U.S.-China relationship. He said it was guided by an understanding of non-conflict, non-confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. That's language that the Chinese have used for a long time. and, and past U.S. administrations have declined to use. So what what signal is he sending by using that word-for-word -word identical language uh, to the Chinese? Um, I, I think the message he, he is sending or he w tried to send in his visit to Beijing writ large was that we want a cooperative, productive, forward-looking relationship with China. Um, I'm not going to parse out the language that he used or whether that mirrored uh, similar language from the Chinese, except to say that um, we've also been very clear, and he's been clear on the record, to say that, you know, there are areas of cooperation, there are areas we agree on that we can really make, uh, uh, we believe, progress on. Um, there are areas we need to make progress on and deal with and address, such as North Korea. Um, and then there are areas where we disagree, and that includes trade. And that also includes, uh, frankly, human rights. And with respect to trade, we want just a level, level playing field uh, for U.S. companies. Uh, but we believe that can also be turned, uh, obviously, uh, to both our advantage. But was, there, was he sending a signal? I mean, this isn't just generalized yeah. agreement. These, this is word for word using language. The Chinese play, place a high degree of importance in the specifics of how their language is used in these speeches. He's, using identical words, uh, a, a phrasing that is very important to them. So w was he sending a signal by using uh, the exact same words, or was this not intentional? I think he was trying to convey that, uh, you know, in his uh, dialogue, in our dialogue with China, um, we also want a quote-unquote win-win relationship, um, but we're going to um, make sure that we press our priorities uh, in that respect. Uh, Just so, the last yeah, thing, though, is he aware of the significance, or is, is his staff aware of the significance that this exact phrase He was aware of his word choice, case? yes. I wouldn't say in China. Say in China. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle. So the Chinese media is portraying this visit as a big win, and they're citing the use of those specific words as a part of that. So on the U.S. side, what kind of win is this? Um, did did he get some assurances from China, uh, especially on the North Korea issue, and and also on the islands? Sure. Um, with respect to um, the. The overall visit, I think it was a, a, a positive visit. Um, I don't think we were looking for any uh, major outcomes. Uh, obviously, uh, we were talking, or he was there to talk about the, the challenge of North Korea, first and foremost. That was, a, frankly, a, a theme throughout his trip. Um, and how do we address it going forward? How do we address this threat going forward? Um, I can't say that we've found any solutions, but we're continuing those conversations. 
Um, and I think he was very clear in how we perceive the threat, and you all saw that through his remarks about it. Uh, with respect to um, your other questions, were your, your follow-ups were on the islands as well as? Yeah, I mean, do, would you say that this moved the needle at all in cooperation on no pressuring North Korea um, and also the island activity? I would say it's part of an ongoing conversation, and certainly we're going to see that when President Xi comes uh, to the United States for his visit. So part of this is laying the groundwork for that, so that's a productive, forward-looking, results-oriented visit. Just Tillerson, you know, in his confirmation hearing, when he, he had a, a fairly forceful bit where he said uh, the island building stops um, and some other, uh, other statements on that. Does he still feel the same way about that? Uh, look, we're very clear in our position with respect to the South China Sea, which is, you know, um, we believe that um, uh, with respect to any kind of uh, construction or uh, attempt to uh, create um, or enhance uh, construction on that, uh, on those islands, uh, that that's counterproductive, that it only increases tensions in the region, and that we need uh, a format for dialogue so that all the claimants uh, with respect to the South China Sea can resolve their uh, concerns um, through a diplomatic uh, process. Uh, with respect to the United States, we don't have a dog in that fight. All we ask for is the freedom to sail uh, or fly our boats or our ships and the planes uh, through that area. It's freedom of navigation. To what extent was that discussed on this? Uh, I know it was raised. I don't know the exact extent okay. it was discussed, but All that's right. something we always raise with them. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, please. Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Follow up, uh, Secretary Tillerson's language again. <laughs> when Secretary Tillerson visited Japan last week, Secretary Tillerson said that uh, Japan is an important alliance to United States, and. South Korea is an important partner. What does it mean about two different expressions? His expression about this. Uh, word? Look, uh, again, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on, on a choice of a word choice there. Um, obviously, both are strong allies and partners in the region, um, and that's frankly evidenced by the fact that, um, with respect to uh, uh, Republic of Korea, uh, he has. Uh, spoken with uh, Foreign Minister Yoon uh, several times and met with him several times already. And the same goes for Japan. So uh, there's, you know, I don't want to get into uh, any argument over who's uh, more important in this relationship. We consider both uh, vitally uh, important to the United States. President Please. Trump called uh, acting president of, of South Korea, Mr. Hwang. He said that 100% uh, uh, alliance to United States he mentioned that both country, U.S. I mean Japan and South Korea. Well, there you but go. Why a secretary? I, I, I wouldn't. Again, I wouldn't read anything into that. One I, another one. Was there? Any, was there any reason why Secretary Tillerson did not have a dinner with South Korean Foreign Minister? Wasn't on the schedule. It was never any dinner scheduled. Um, secretary had very productive, uh, long uh, meetings uh, with Korea, his Korean counterparts, um, and then I think he ended up having a private dinner with his staff. Um, so there wasn't a question, and that was something we saw in some of the media accounts. There was never any question of him being fatigued or having fatigue and, and waving off dinner. Uh, that was never the case. Uh, he simply it wasn't on his schedule. That's a diplomatic gesture or? Not at all. Not no, at it just all. wasn't, I'm sorry, it just wasn't, it wasn't on his schedule. It was never scheduled. Uh, as I said, he had a private dinner with his staff. Uh, but. That's not to say that his meetings with his Korean counterparts weren't productive. He had a dinner with the, the, the foreign minister in Japan, but why he skipped it? I'm aware there was no. <laughs> I'm I'm simply stating that there was never any dinner scheduled. Even if he tired, he have to do with the diplomatic. He wasn't tired. There was never yeah, any dinner scheduled. Yeah, I don't know how plain I can talk to do. After a trans well, tired flight. doesn't mean anything. Beyond even. jet lagged, I mean we're all jet lagged. No, I'm just seriously though. It was there just wasn't a dinner planned. It wasn't scheduled. So I'm not sure why that's become such a, a sticking point, but it, it shouldn't be. Are we, uh, yeah, let's I'll come back to you there. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Nicole. We're, we're gonna, let's stay on Korea side. Yeah. I just want to come back to Nick's question Sorry. about uh, about the language. You said that Secretary Tillerson was aware of the language he was using and he chose it deliberately. And in the Chinese context, the phrase mutual respect means something with regard to Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan. It, it indicates 
their belief that the U.S. should stay out of uh, issues and areas that China, that Beijing believes are its own purview. So I'm wondering, in using that language and choosing those words deliberately, is he signaling some sort of shift on Taiwan, on not Tibet, on? Not at all. However, okay. our, our stance on Taiwan is, apart from encouraging uh, good, strong, increasingly strong um, uh, cross-strait relations, that we stand by our one China policy. With respect to other aspects of the relationship, we're not walking away from our concerns about human rights, uh, personal freedoms within China. Um, I, I think he also said uh, at one of his press avails during the trip was that, you know, human rights is part and parcel, is embedded, I think he said, in all of our uh, conversations and all of our discussions of the issues uh, with respect to China, but with respect to other countries as well. So there's no backing away from that. I, I want to be clear about that. Follow up with a Korea-related question. I don't want um, Korea-related. Korea sure. Korea-related question. Yeah. The um, the representative of the six-party talks, Mr. Yun, was what met in China with officials about the issue, and the Chinese readout said that their talks were extremely frank. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those extremely frank talks. I, I can't. I don't have a readout, but I know Zhou Yun is in the in the uh, in the region. Uh, I think we put out a meeting note the other day. Uh, th these are useful follow-ups. It's also pre-planned. I mean, this was a long time in the plan, planning stages, but the timing helps because now we can follow up on some of the conversations that Secretary Tillerson had. Okay, we're going to Korea. Korea. I'm uh, going to finish in, up. You're in addition, next in line, side. I just can't cut off. Yeah, in issue. addition to not uh, scheduling uh, the dinner uh, in Korea, there was no, uh, there was nothing on the schedule about visiting the embassies in the three cities concerned. Uh, he, he didn't uh, we wasn't able to find any time on this trip, uh, and I don't think he's ever found any time on the trip to meet with U.S. diplomatic staff in their missions abroad. Is uh, is this something he hopes to do? Is, uh, does, does he accept that some diplomats might be disappointed after preparing the, the trips that uh, he hasn't had time to, to meet with them and their families? Well, I know he obviously, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of embassy staff and personnel uh, who are seconded to the trip. Uh, and in fact, even more so in Secretary Tillerson's case, uh, given the small footprint that he travels with, and I know he expresses appreciation for their work uh, during his visit. Uh, with respect to visiting the embassies, uh, I think that's something he would uh, obviously consider going forward, just hasn't had the time yet. So I, can we, go there? we can go. Sorry, when, great, you said, when you said there's a lot of people seconded to the, to, to the visit, so you're saying that, and, and he's expressed his appreciation to them? I mean, he, he met with them personally? I think say, he did. I think he you. met with yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, go, I go ahead. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, on the U.S. boycotting U.N. discussion on Israeli human rights abuses, you issued a statement saying the United States strongly and unequivocally, unequivocally opposes the existence of the U.N. Human Rights Council on Agenda Item 7, Human Rights Situation in Palestine and the Occupied Arab Territories. Are you saying that there are no human rights abuses in the Palestinian territories? Why do you, now, why look, do you so unequivocally oppose that? Because it's... It specifically targets Israel. Well, I mean, isn't there an occupation yeah, but, but that it's, is practiced it's, by Israel against look, the Palestinians? Look, again, it, it's not it, – agenda item, agenda item 7 specifically targets Israel for, uh, frankly, repeated and unjustified uh, scrutiny, criticism, and abuse. Um, and we, the United States, oppose any effort to delegitimize or uh, isolate Israel. Um, and it's not just within the HRC, it's wherever it occurs. And we've been very clear about this. This is not something new necessarily, but when it happens, we're going to state our disagreement. Independent of targeting Israel, I mean, you do acknowledge there is a military occupation. You do acknowledge there are like 750 checkpoints and so on. There are human rights abuses. It's been cited in your own uh, human rights report. So why do you unequivocally oppose uh, discussing that item? Again, because we feel it's, it's out of context, it's, uh, it's specifically biased against Israel, uh, and frankly, it's, uh, it, uh, it discredits the entire organization because it is so specifically geared and targeting uh, a country, uh, uh, we think, that is in, in an unwarranted way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's not to say that we can't have discussions about human rights in Israel and Saudi Arabia in wherever, in the United States, uh, as long as we view that it's done in a, an open, transparent, and 
and frankly uh, productive way. We don't believe uh, that agenda item seven in any way, shape, or form accomplishes that. Independent of the council, you acknowledge that there are Israeli human rights abuses of the Palestinian people under occupation, don't you? Well, I'd refer you to our human rights report and what that lays out, which is US, uh, the U.S. perspective on it. Can I, uh, you Please. Said, you said correctly that uh, the successive administrations have said that the council and its predecessor uh, have been un, un, uh, fairly attacking Israel, biased <clears throat> resolutions and such. Um, but have you ever boycotted the entire discussion and announced before the vote on agenda item seven that you would vote uh, against everything in it? So the first part of your question, I, I think that is unique to today that we specifically boycotted. I think to some extent it had to do with the timing um, with respect to, you know, we, we normally would sit and listen to the explanation of vote. I'll, I'll correct this if it's wrong, I apologize. But, but because of the timing of it, uh, we wanted to put out a statement uh, prior to it and simply boycott the vote. No, but haven't you in the past, um, no. I Sorry, go ahead. Asking well, maybe you could take, could you take the question? I would just I'll ask a question. I'll take because the question. I don't think you boycotted the vote. You've already always voted no, I think. Yes, that's, that's but true. But I don't know that you've, no. ever vote, that you've ever boycotted the actual debate about the item before. Are you saying that if you haven't before, it's because the vote and the debate have been on the same day, and so you've just gone for the debate said that you're opposed and then voted against? That's correct. And I think that's right. But I'll check on that. Okay, I'll but in question. the past, you have, the U.S. actually has registered its objections yes. within the meeting itself and not in a statement. Yes, that's, that's my understanding. Thank you. No, the, the, the Israelis are prosecuting <laughs> two, one uh, Palestinian poli uh, poet and one uh, Palestinian journalist for posting things that are related to the right to resist the occupation. And calling that incitement. Yeah. Have you seen that? You're talking about the Facebook incitement? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, we're always concerned about yeah. reports of incitement to violence. Um, I, I'm not going to weigh in on every incident. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in principle, we do, of course, uh, support the right to free speech. Um, I just uh, I don't have any more details with, it, with respect to this case. And like, going back to that. Sorry. Go ahead, finish that. No, that's okay. My mind is extremely brief. Okay. Sure. I wanted to ask if you could comment on the Israeli raid uh, on Syria and Damascus and then the, the, the consequential uh, rockets and so on from Syrian territory. Oh, the, 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 oh, but the on, on Friday, the Israelis raided a position in, um, I guess, in Syria near Damascus. And the, the I mean, obviously, I'd refer you to Israeli uh, security forces and the Israeli government to speak to that. But, uh, you know, there's this is not the first time that Israel has been threatened by uh, by Syria's uh, forces along the border, and and uh, is that attack? I understand Syria? that, but yeah. you know they were acting out of uh, uh, I think uh, concern. But I'd refer you to the Israeli government to speak to it. Just, uh, I'm just curious as to you know if previous the previous previous administrations have actually sat in on the debate and participated in the debate in the council on this. Why did why 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 did the, this administration make the decision not even to take part? Is it because that your that previous administration's objections were never heard uh, or accepted by other members of the, of the council, or is there some other reason? Um, let me uh, let me take the question in terms of the protocol. Iraq? Yeah, I'll do Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi prime minister is here with a delegation that includes the chief of staff to KRG President Barzani, and their meetings include with Secretary Tillerson. What are the main issues on the agenda of these talks, and what are your goals in these discussions? Sure. Um, as you noted, uh, the Prime Minister is in town um, uh, with the delegation, um, and I think Secretary Tillerson is meeting uh, at the White House, with, along with the President, obviously, uh, taking part in that meeting uh, later today. Um, our goals are pretty straightforward. Um, it's uh, to reiterate our support for the Iraqis uh, in their long struggle to defeat and destroy ISIS. Uh, we also want to encourage them to uh, take the necessary steps uh, to prevent the reemergence of ISIS, uh, and to. We also want to communicate our support uh, for a prosperous, unified, and democratic Ara democratic Iraq uh, going forward. Um, you know, uh, under Prime Minister Abadi, uh, Iraq has made uh, real progress with respect to uh, defeating and destroying uh, ISIS. 
um, what comes next is another aspect of uh, ensuring that ISIS doesn't come back, and that's uh, dealing with uh, economic, political reforms, but also ensuring uh, uh, that uh, we deal with some of the tensions in Iraqi society and also reestablish, uh, I'm talking about stabilization uh, efforts here, uh, reestablish order, uh, infrastructure, uh, so that places like Mosul can uh, welcome back uh, those who fled or those who've stayed, uh, frankly. On the political reforms, I assume you have, you know, the, the building has some ideas on that. Would they include sort of decentralization of authority and power within um, Iraq? Or what yeah, I mean, some of these things are, are well known uh, with respect to uh, our concerns. But again, we feel that Prime Minister Abadi has been, uh, so far, uh, showed himself to be a willing partner. He's tackled uh, some of these reforms himself uh, already. Uh, so um, we're positive going forward that he's going to take uh, – uh, uh, additional steps. Can I stay on Iraq? Yes, let's say. Uh, just uh, follow up on uh, Laura's uh, question. Uh, you usually, you know, repeat this unified Iraq. Is it a message to the Kurds that sometimes they are, uh, you know, especially during the spring, that they are uh, claiming to have an independence or separation from the uh, from Iraq? And that's uh, just a follow up. And the second question is going to be. Uh, the Iraq's demand several times, the Iraqi officials, including the Prime Minister Abadi, asked for activating the strategic agreement with the United States. Do you have this the, the last part again, I'm sorry. The, uh, the, uh, the Iraqi Prime Minister several times asked for reactivating the strategic agreement with the United States. Uh, is there any, like, willing from your side to activate this strategic agreement beyond ISIS, beyond military cooperation? Uh, with respect to the strategic agreement, I don't have uh, an update on that. Um, I, I think, as, like I said, our focus, immediate focus, and that's going to be obviously true uh, with respect to the ministerial on Wednesday and Thursday this week, uh, is how do we ensure uh, a quick – how do we accelerate our efforts to destroy and defeat ISIS, uh, but then how do we, uh, uh, again, redouble our efforts to uh, uh, stabilize uh, those areas that have been liberated from ISIS. With respect to uh, uh, the unity of Iraq, uh, you're right, that is something we, we make a point of saying. But ultimately, these are all internal, internal political discussions that Iraq needs to have uh, uh, with all ethnic groups uh, resident in the country. Yep. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, sure. Does Iraqi forces have increasingly uh, relied on, turned to airstrikes and artillery in their operations in western Mosul? We've seen more and more reports, accounts of, from locals describing situations where airstrikes hit not only uh, houses, n not only houses where ISIL is located, but also nearby buildings, uh, killing many civilians. Does the United States do anything to change the manner in which these bombings are carried out? Well, uh, sure. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, again, I preface um, my response by saying, you know, that's something that DOD can speak with, uh, speak to in greater detail. But uh, of course, uh, whenever there are legitimate uh, allegations of uh, civilian casualties, uh, we investigate them. And uh, I, I don't have the um, the website in front of me, the URL address for it. But there is a website uh, that DOD Department of Defense uh, maintains that actually uh, aggregates any of these claims. Uh, and follows through on them, which means it puts out a report uh, about uh, the incident, uh, whether it's credible, whether it's not, what happened, what steps are taking are going to be taken to address uh, any civilian casualties, and also amend it going forward. Please go on ahead. that website. There haven't been updates in the past month. I think it's. I, 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 I was about to say. I think it's a monthly basis, so I don't know. Um, but these things also take. Sorry, but these things also take time, uh, obviously, because it's a battlefield. Um, but in, in direct response to your question. Yes. When there are credible claims of civilian casualties, uh, they're investigated uh, by the U.S. military or by the Iraqi security forces. Reports are made, uh, assessments are made, and any uh, corrective measures are taken to avoid any uh, regrettable incidents in the future. So yes uh, to the question. The question was, does the United States do anything to change the manner in which the bombings are? Right I think now we're, we always, we always. We, so based on reports, uh, assessments, we would always take steps, obviously, to avoid uh, civilian casualties uh, going forward. I just have one more follow-up. Yeah, um, so in in one instance, an airstrike hit a house. Um, 
killed, according to a witness, three people, uh, severely injured a five-year-old girl. Uh, and her this father said it took, yes, uh, a neighborhood in Mosul. And her father said it <laughs> took them three days to get her to the hospital. With that, I want to ask, what does the U.S. do <laughs> to help people exit the fighting and get help? They do, and I can get you more details, but uh, obviously uh, we've been working in conjunction with the U.N., but uh, Iraqi security forces and creating corridors uh, to get uh, civilians out safely. Uh, we had set up with the U.N. Uh, basically refugee uh, facilities and camps uh, so that uh, those displaced by the fighting in Mosul uh, could find uh, temporary shelter uh, in the aftermath or during the fighting. Uh, that said, it's an active battlefield, and so, you know, obviously, uh, it's very difficult in some circumstances. I don't know the incident you're speaking about uh, specifically, but, you know, uh, it, that, it, that it might take some delay. I just I don't know specifically the, the incident you're referring to. But in general, uh, we have taken uh, steps to and, – and, frankly, the Iraqi government has taken steps. Uh, a couple more questions, guys? Uh, uh, how about yourself? Hi. Oh. Global Ministers Conference. Uh, could you talk about why this is happening now, and uh, do you expect a shift from the Obama administration coalition strategy, or more of a broad continuation strategy? You're talking about the so the global coalition, yeah. Um, uh, so um, it's happening. This is the first full coalition uh, meeting or ministerial since I think uh, 2014 December. Um, so this is a full 68 member uh, uh, ministerial meeting. Um, I think it's, first of all, it's an opportunity in the new administration to assess where we're at and what we want to do going forward. Um, I don't want to steal any uh, thunder from the secretary, but I think we will, he will come with new ideas and new approaches and a new way of looking at uh, the counter, or rather the, um, uh, how to defeat ISIS. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the it's going to focus on how we uh, accentuate, accelerate uh, the efforts across the multiple lines of effort. And again, this is an opportunity because it's the big meeting for us really to have specific conversations with the countries who are doing uh, work in these various areas and leading efforts in these various areas. I mean, there are some who have taken a more kinetic uh, um, uh, uh, role, and then there are others who are working, as I said, in the information. Uh, sphere and the internet and, and trying to uh, uh, confront and address uh, ISIS's uh, efforts to recruit uh, using the internet. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a multiple lined effort. I think it's an assessment period, but I also think there's going to be some new ideas put on the table. Please, Barbara. Just in terms of the new ideas, approach, et cetera, where does Mr. Tillerson and the administration feel that the current approach isn't working? I don't think so. I think. Uh, Again, I think everyone recognizes there's been significant progress uh, in the past uh, year, especially. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, gains uh, made against ISIS uh, across the board, uh, whether it's in Syria, uh, but certainly in, in, in Iraq, uh, liberations of, of uh, large areas that they previously held. Um, I think it's a way to accelerate and focus more on how we can accelerate our efforts. And where do safe zones fit in this? Uh Realignment sure. or strategy? Uh, it's a good question. I think it's something that's uh, obviously still being thought out. Uh, this will be an opportunity, I think, to talk uh, in a little bit more detail. I don't have anything to preview. Uh, we still in this, or you want to go ahead? Separate topic. Yeah. Um, an LGBT group is accused the Center for Family and Human Rights of violating federal ethics laws by using their position as part of the UN, U.S. delegation to the U.N. Commission on the Status of Women Conference to uh, solicit donations. Do you have any comment on that? And then as a follow-up, who actually made the decision to allow this group, which has been designated as a hate group, to actually have status as part of the U.S. delegation to this conference? Sure. Um, so. Uh, we, I spoke a little bit about this last week. Um, you know, the United States does seek to include individuals from uh, civil society organizations with uh, diverse viewpoints uh, and allow them to observe the UN in action uh, during uh, the Commission on Status of Women, uh, as they're called public delegates. Um, and they can attend formal meetings of the uh, Commission uh, as well as side events. Um, they're not, however, authorized to negotiate or speak on behalf of the U United States. Um, with respect to uh, your question about who 
uh, chose these uh, individuals. I think I'd have to refer to the White House. I think they're responsible for uh, the selection of these individuals uh, who participate in this commission. Yep. Okay, a couple of questions about European relations. Uh, uh, UK Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson will be in the building on Wednesday for the ISIS conference. I understand uh, that you'll also have a bilateral meeting with Secretary Tillerson. Uh, uh, will he be taking the, this opportunity to bring up concerns that uh, British intelligence service may have bugged Trump Tower in the run-up to the election? You'll have to ask him. I don't know. <laughs> I'm asking his book. <laughs> you know, I'm not Boris Johnson's, uh, no, really, much really, as I like him. Could you tell us and be taking the opportunity to bring up oh, I'm sorry. U.S. I, concerns? I, I thought you were saying, okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Yes. Um I, I don't know what specifically. I think they'll uh, probably focus on the issues of the day, which is uh, defeating ISIS. Okay, and uh, over the weekend it was reported that uh, Marine Le Pen's uh, campaign is saying that they met U.S. officials uh, in recent days. Uh, obviously, you don't have an ambassador to France or to anywhere very much, but um, uh, who met with Marine Le Pen uh, and what level? And I, I appreciate you might need to take that question because that's... Um, I, I will. I, mean, I will take the question, but I will also uh, uh, push back on your, uh, your assertion that we don't have ambassadors. Uh, we have chargés in many places where there were politically appointed ambassadors who have since left post, but we also have acting ambassadors or, or ambassadors, ambassadors serving ambassadors. How many ambassadors, ambassadors have you appointed to the 76 open positions? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Those are all being vetted, and mm. as they would but normally is it through more the than cycle. More than zero. You're saying? How many ambassadors have you appointed? So. Um, we don't need to walk through this, but I'm happy to do it for you. So they would go through the chief of mission selection so process, and then they're being vetted now by the new administration. So the old, previous administration has selected individuals. They're being vetted, uh, but then ultimately they'll be sent to the Senate for confirmation. I'm sorry? For one, the one answer, 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 yeah, yeah, I mean, isn't the yes. answer to his question one? I, I think so, point. but that's a White House. I'm not going to speak to the White House's equities. Is that it, guys? No. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Last question. No, no, Michelle. What? Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Oh. I owe you one. No problem. Um, okay, speaking of White House relations, um, I'm just wondering about this tweet that the president sent out while Tillerson was traveling, that China hasn't done much to help on the North Korea situation. Um, it was related to his statement that North Korea has been a bad actor. Um, did, did that affect Tillerson's communications at all while he was there? Did he need to explain that tweet or talk about that tweet? Because we've seen things like a single tweet affecting his conversations in other places, like Mexico, for example. Mm -hmm. Was this a similar situation? Well, uh, I would argue that uh, it, uh, it didn't break new ground in the sense that China knows that we believe they can do more uh, with respect to uh, uh, addressing uh, North Korea's bad behavior. Um, we've said that many, many times. Um, the fact that the president chose to say it in the tweet, I think, signifies uh, how concerned and at what level we're concerned about. Did it, did it affect conversations there, though? Did, did he need think, to I mean, address I, the tweet? I mean, I, I, I wasn't obviously on the trip. Uh, my, my, uh, my assessment or my understanding is that no. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Please. I, this is a budget question. Yep. Um, I, I realize that uh, we just have the top line, the, the, the blueprint, and that a lot of stuff still needs to be uh, to go, be gone through in detail, and there are not a lot of specifics out there. But one thing that we do know, in addition to uh, the Israel carve-out, is that the climate change um, funding has been eliminated. Uh, the climate change, the whole initiative itself, but including the, the Green Climate Fund. Right. Um, when he was asked about this at the white at a White House briefing last week, the president's OMB director said simply, well, "We're not going to pay for that anymore." And I'm curious to know, since you speak for a building that, for the last eight years until January at least, had put climate change as a priority, whether or not uh, the administration generally and the State Department specifically thinks that climate change. Uh, remains a, a, a threat, or is a is a threat. I, I think uh, that th this building and this administration recognize that climate change is a threat, but I think they're still assessing how uh, big a threat and how we approach that threat. Um, I think specifically with respect to your question, um, 
I think the concern was that um, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that we're eliminating all climate programs. Um, I think it's part of, though, a broader assessment of where we can um, curb or, uh, or uh, in any way uh, decrease funding uh, in, in an effort to, uh, as we said, uh, as they were very clear in the budget, um, uh, try to exert some fiscal responsibility and to try to uh, uh, reduce the overall budget obligations. So the administration but, does believe that climate change, this administration agrees with the previous administration that climate change I, is a threat. I, I think Secretary, just doesn't want to I think Secretary Chilson, no, but that's the, the Green Climate Fund. And, and again, you know, these are all, uh, I don't have much additional details, as you said, preface in your question, well, but, but these are, Green Climate Fund is one aspect or one funding mechanism for addressing climate change. It's not the sole uh, uh, way we would address well, I understand it. understand that, but, it, but the, at least the previous administration, and in particular, this building during the previous administration, and the guy who headed this building, thought that the Green Climate Fund was of big importance, and I'm just, do you, do you still think that helping developing nations meet their emissions uh, meet emissions targets as agreed to in Paris is is an important uh, goal. I, I think, or no, they should pay for it themselves. I, I, no, no. I, I, I think or you fair. don't think it's a problem? No, no. I, no, no we, I think we think climate change is a problem. I think we're looking at. Uh, I think I'll just say we're looking at uh, the issue broadly speaking, and how we address it in the best possible yeah, way. But, so but the budget director said flat out, we're just we're not going to pay for that. With respect to the Green Climate Fund. With a, I think the question that he was responding to was climate, the climate change initiative more broadly. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware. Again, these are conversations that are ongoing. I just don't need more details. Sorry. What climate programs are you keeping? You said it wasn't going to eliminate all climate programs. Well, again, I think that's part of something we're looking at right now. I mean, these are, again, early days. Uh, I know that they were specifically mentioned about the Green Climate Fund, but, uh, you know, we're assessing, and that's not just climate issues or climate funding as well. We're addressing issues across, or funding, rather, across the board. That's, climate change issues have been particularly targeted. I wouldn't say that. I mean, well, I would say, say like it assistance. Says, it, it says what? the budget outline says that the entire initiative is going to be my book. is going to be removed. <laughs> What's that? The, the the budget outline says it's going to be entirely removed. The climate in, initiative, the climate including initiative, including the Green Climate Fund. Fund. Climate Fund. Yeah. Again. So I, the question is why? Not just that you don't want to pay for it anymore, because that's a that's that's an answer, but why? If if it's still a problem, again, I, I I don't have much more detail to provide you other than that you know we're looking at climate, we're looking at other areas like assistance and how we can rejigger our priorities, but also uh, look at uh, how we spend that money. It's not to say that we're not going to spend any money on the environmental though. Um, or on climate change, but uh, I think we're just looking at ways we can. Are you still going to be uh, up here when when the f full budget comes out? <laughs> we can we can quiz you. On no that? comment. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.